Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Uh, welcome everyone to the July 2020 monthly webinar series from Phase One Industrial. Our, uh, today's webinar is related to optimizing your aerial images with Capture One. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Carsten Wieser. I'm Integrator Sales Manager for EMEA region and I'm based in uh, Cologne in, in Germany. And when we have finished uh, the webinar, we will have some time for question and answers uh, to Capture One and uh, how to optimize uh, these aerial images. So if there is any question that you have during this webinar uh, presentation, you can type in a message in the question chat box of the GoToWebinar app. And my colleague Matthias Motz uh, will take those questions at the end and share it with us and I will try to answer them directly. So let's start now with the webinar and some very few corporate slides. Yeah, phase one is uh, the world leading provider of digital medium format imaging solutions founded 1993 in Denmark and we, we provide ultra high resolution cameras uh, and highly productive software uh, solutions. So here you see the different uh, business units uh, for professional photography, the industrial units uh, divided for aerial photography and ground photography and the software businesses for Capture One, where we see a bit uh, from today and uh, also for other software we uh, developed for the industrial applications. So for the aerial business, we serve the market with a lot of uh, um, dedicated products. Uh, it's starting with a range of uh, lenses uh, made by Phase One, by Rodenstock and Schneider Kreuznach, uh, which are um, giving a wide range of, of flexibility for the different missions. All the um, lenses are equipped with a very reliable uh, shutter, which is very fast, up to three frames per second, two, uh, one to 2,500 of a second as short as shutter speed. Minimum half a million activations um, and uh, 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 even available for UV application with a motorized lens. So then we have a couple of types of cameras ranging from 50 megapixel to 100 to 150 to 190 with a dual uh, lens setup and up to the uh, 280 megapixel sensor, uh, which uh, consists to uh, 150 megapixel sensors. All these cameras can be available with RGB and near infrared uh, solutions, and they are equipped with very fast storage options like, uh, like internally for XQ memory cards, externally with USB 3 or 10G Ethernet. Uh, we have a, a dedicated computer, uh, uh, we call it ICE controller, which can be installed into aircrafts as a storage unit, as a digital uh, center of, of the system. Uh, and as well, we uh, provide a couple of software products, which is ranging from IX Capture, uh, which you also see a bit in this webinar. Um, uh, you can use it for monitoring the cameras for processing images. Uh, capture One, uh, the software uh, we see today uh, for optimizing the images, and uh, we have a planning, flight planning software and a flight uh, a management software. And last but not least, uh, an SDK, uh, which helps partners uh, and integrators to develop uh, on software solution with phase one technology. But today we will see uh, mainly Capture One. Um, Capture One is uh, a yeah, very long time on the market. And uh, today we have uh, the version 20 as youngest and newest. Um, I will today concentrate on the former version, which is uh, Capture One 12 because our software IX Capture, which you will see in combination running with Capture One is uh, still um, installed. Uh, the, the Capture One rendering engine, so the processing engine is from Capture One 12 installed. We will see a, a Capture One 20 version of it uh, later the year, but from today uh, you need to use Capture One 12 if you work in combination. Capture One 20 can do everything what Capture One 12 can, but even more. Uh, but Capture One 12, again, is uh, the, uh, the basis also for ICE Capture today. Uh, so let's concentrate on this. Capture One, you can get for Macintosh and Windows, and ICE Capture is a pure Windows uh, application. You can download uh, Capture One 12, so the older version from our website, captureone.com. You need uh, to register, uh, and then you can go to the software archive where you have access to uh, former versions. If you just uh, press the download button, you end up with, uh, with Capture One 20. Uh, uh, search for the um, uh, history for the archive, software archive, and then you can, can download this. The iX Capture software you can download from the uh, website industrial.phase1.com. 
here, just a screenshot from the software archive uh, so that you know how to download the 12 version if you want. Yeah, Capture on 12. If you start the software the first time after installation, you need to select uh, which license or which type of license you want to activate. And there's a couple of options you see because Capture One is not only used for the aerial application, you also have uh, lots of photographers that are using it and also um, uh, pro professionals that are using uh, uh, raw images and convert them to nice looking images. Uh, so here you see a lot of uh, versions for the pro version, which has uh, all the full feature setup uh, versions dedicated for different uh, camera manufacturers. But on the right, you also see the pro, pro DB version. This is Capture One for camera uh, phase one camera owners. So here you not need any license code, just press pro DB and then the software activates uh, for unlimited use with images from phase one cameras. So when you uh, when we're talking about images from phase one cameras, we're always talking about the phase one raw format, which is named .iiq. Uh, all the aerial products you see on the left hand side uh, generate uh, these files and uh, then it stores either on internal storage or external storage um, and uh, you have two formats uh, to choose. So we once have IRQL, which is the largest uh, file. It is uh, the best possible image quality for the aerial cameras. And you can say that uh, this, uh, in terms of size, uh, it is uh, smaller than the, uh, uh, that the, uh, the image product, what you get out of it, because we do a lossless compression on the uh, raw file, so that you can say that a 100 megapixel camera has roughly a 100 megabyte um, raw file size in IRQL. Same as for 150 megapixel, again, roughly 150 megapixel of raw file size. You can optimize it in terms of uh, storage space. If you select IRQS, it is again a raw file. It is a full resolution, but it is a, a bit compressed, a bit stronger compressed. Um, and it's nearly not visible and, uh, uh, and nearly lossless. Uh, it is not lossless, that's why I'm telling you that, but it's nearly lossless and is a very good alternative if you have bigger projects and you need uh, to save some storage space because then you save one third uh, in average uh, of storage uh, space. So it means from the 100 megapixel, you have roughly 75 megab uh, megabyte uh, storage space for every single image. So yeah, uh, coming to Capture One, when you're starting Capture One, you get a little logo screen and then the software normally directly starts when it's activated. Uh, already you see here the normal home screen when you start the application first time. Uh, to guide you uh, what, what you find here, uh, we have the main tool tab on the left hand side. There are all the main tools located. We have then the tool tab, uh, so it means every symbol in the main tool tab uh, has a different row of uh, tools behind it. And, and then you see them on the left. We have the viewer where you yeah, uh, see your images uh, when scrolling to, through your browser. And on the browser, you see uh, the, the content of the folder you have selected on the left. So they are always displayed the images in the uh, selected folder. When you start first time with Capture One, you can use a, 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 a little organization structure, what we called a session. There are two options for Capture One. You can create a session or a catalog. A session is more the simple approach. I also would suggest you for aerial images to start with this because it's easy um, to, to um, get uh, uh, into the workflow. The catalogs are mainly for uh, photographers that uh, is a uh, full image database and you can organize images over years for different projects and so on. So you have a more flexibility to organize these images, but to keep it simple, uh, I would suggest you start uh, this session. By doing so in the main window on the left hand side, there is a the folder symbol, which is now orange. When you have this selected, you can press this little plus button here um, and then you can create a new session or a new catalog. Uh, again, the session is the more simple approach. And then when you click new session, you get this window and can name the session in the first place and then uh, decide on which storage location uh, you want uh, to create this session. 
Uh, furthermore, uh, Capture One uh, creates a simple folder structure, uh, which is uh, uh, yeah, it's a sub four subfolders you you will get automatically. So in the uh, capture uh, in the in the session folder, which you name individually, you find a capture folder, a select folder, output folder, and trash. The capture is for all new images, so means if you import new images from your hard disk, uh, from an external server, or from uh, the camera itself, when you directly attach it to Capture One, all the new incoming images will uh, end up here. When you uh, want to select a few of these uh, source images and uh, um, select your favorites, you can push it to the selects folder. When you start to develop uh, images, so from RAW to TIFF or other formats, then if you not change anything, uh, it will directly guide it into the output folder. And when you um, delete a, a file, uh, it will be transported into the trash folder. So it means everything what you do uh, is then inside this folder, in the this session folder, you can uh, work on this comp on one computer uh, with your session, transfer the folder from computer A to computer B, when there's also Capture One installed, you can run the session from the second computer just by transferring the folder. And when you open there the session, uh, you will see exactly the same what you had before on the first machine. Even the trash is transported if you not uh, um, clear it before. Yeah, so everything is inside this uh, session. You don't need uh, particularly to do to do or to use a session. You also can directly inside the uh, capture one. You can go to your uh, your folders, do your drives, and directly can also select images there. But if you do so, uh, please remember you need to select a valid output folder uh, later on when you convert the images. Yes, so starting uh, with the general overview uh, to capture one, uh, we ha will have a deeper look uh, to the main tool tab where all the um, different uh, tools are located. Here we have a list of all the, the tool tabs uh, and then there's a library tool tab where you have the direct access to your session or to the hard drives. We have some filters there. If you mark uh, uh, images during your work, you can filter here uh, um, uh, for ratings on or color text or something else. We have the capture uh, tool tab where all the tools are related when you directly connect the camera to the computer and shoot into the computer. As we mainly use for that IX capture, this is normally not uh, in use for air aerial applications. We have the lens tool tabs. This is also mainly concentrating for needs for professional photographers um, because the lens correction tool we normally avoid to use in, in aerial images because we want to use metric calibrations to optimize uh, our images. So uh, we will see later on how to customize uh, the view uh, of the tools uh, to get you uh, the, only the, the tools display which you need to do uh, need to use. Yeah, then the color tool tab, all the uh, tools which uh, can manipulate the color of the image, exposure tool tab, everything where you can uh, change exposure values, uh, recover highlights, recover shadows, uh, do a levels con uh, uh, optimization and all this, but we will see more in deep uh, later on. Then it uh, continues with the detail tool tab. So all the details from the image uh, on the pixel level you can see and also manipulate. Here we have noise reduction, sharpening, if you want to use it uh, or not, you can uh, switch it off. We have the adjustments tool tab where you see all the adjustments uh, when you start to working on images and you want to uh, copy and paste uh, this corrections you have applied to the first image to uh, another image or to a row of images, uh, the adjustment tool tabs will um, help you uh, to do so. Uh, the metadata tool tab is all about metadata. So what uh, the camera has recorded or metadata you can uh, access here. For the professional photographers, there's tools for keywording uh, and, and annotations, but uh, mainly this is not in use in Arial. We have the output uh, uh, tool tab where you can um, structure your output. So it means you can uh, prepare some proce process recipes. If you have um, different kinds of output you, in, you use in, in normal operations, but you also can select all the details to the different file formats, etc. Choose the output location, choose a different naming, and so on. But we will see later on that also this um, we mainly use in IX Capture later on, and we co-working with these tools uh, together. 
Then we have here in Capture One the batch processing queues. That means if you um, optimize a bunch of images and then later on you have uh, 200 images corrected or more, you can in one go can process all these images and send to the processing uh, queue. And then uh, the batch processing tooltip will show you how many images are in, in uh, processing and uh, estimate the time, how long does it take uh, to, to finish them all. And also uh, you see the actual status, so which image is actually in, in processing. So let's uh, yeah uh, dive into the program itself. Uh, so I will show a bit how to import images, how to review images, how to customize uh, the uh, graphic user interface for Capture One so that we streamline it more for the needs uh, for optimizing aerial images because uh, Capture One is also used by photographers that have different needs. Uh, we also learn how to uh, edit images and I do some basic uh, um, explanations, but also uh, we'll show how to copy and apply corrections from one image to a bunch of images. And also we'll uh, give you a proposal of a, a quick optimization um, uh, uh, um, uh, workflow on aerial images, which works quite fine. It's not uh, for all cases the best approach, but it's uh, uh, for a lot of cases very helpful. And as it's uh, very structured and always uh, the same workflow, uh, you can really cover a lot of tasks uh, of this, but more we will see later on. So let me now uh, open Capture One, just a second. Okay. So now um, I have my Capture One uh, opened and you hopefully see it. Um, so this is again the, the, st the very first start. I already have created a session here and now I can continue to import images. This I can do with this little arrow. This is uh, pointing down here. And, um, and uh, here you, um, just a second. Okay, so um, here you can import the images. So you can uh, um, select the source of your images. Where are these located? It can be, again, an, another hard disk. It can be a memory card. Uh, and you just uh, select here uh, which uh, uh, from which uh, source folder you want to import the images. You also get the images displayed uh, here. And then uh, we have uh, uh, the option to either select some images from your source uh, uh, folder or you, if you not select anything, you import all of them. So it means when I click, uh, the software will take action and uh, copy all the images from the source to the uh, Capture One folder, which is uh, normally the starting point of uh, uh, Capture One. And you also see that the software is generating after copying some preview files. And these preview files help you to be fast uh, because we're normally working with very uh, big images um, and uh, we want to, to keep it fast uh, on, on different kinds of computers. So the preview all image is always in place. When you go from image to image, you see that for a little second, there's a less resolution image uh, visible. Or when I, uh, for instance, uh, zoom to an image, um, uh, I, I can uh, show here the first tool uh, I want to explain. So if you take the hand tool here in the center, uh, you can uh, use uh, with the hand tool, you can zoom into an image. So it means when I double click on a certain uh, uh, spot of the image, if you go to 100%. You can use the slider um, to, uh, to go to different zoom stages. And again, double click on a certain uh, point, you uh, zoom in. You can, inside the zoom, you can pan yeah, so to go to another uh, point, you can double click again and you're back. You can do this on another point and so you can review the image. When you are zoomed in, it's also nice and the hand tool is only working when the hand tool is selected. You press the right uh, mouse button. You have a navigator uh, window which always displayed on the place where you press the button. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you can use this little uh, navigator window to navigate through your image. So to, to have a quick, uh, man, uh, to maneuver quickly to a different um, areas of the image. If you, if, if the hand is uh, moving away from this little window, you will see it, it disappear directly. So like this, you can really uh, review the images. You also might have noticed when I zoom into the image, you see again, a little, um, uh, a little um, 
uh, low resolution image is displayed and then the software load uh, the part of the image uh, that uh, you want to display. So it's always nice and quick uh, when doing so. The same as when you're moving to the browser, you see you can move through all the images very quick. Um, and this is possible because of this little preview image what is uh, uh, rendered in the in the first place when you import the images. So please keep the uh, keep some time uh, when the images are imported, uh, depending on your disk speed and, and processing speed. Um, um, but if you wait the two minutes, you will uh, in the beginning you will save a lot of time afterwards. So um, yeah, that's uh, how to review the images. Uh, for instance, uh, you also can. Um, have some helping tools here. So uh, um, when I have, for instance, let me select a good, good image for that. So if you have a scenario like this, uh, you can again zoom into the image. Uh, you can here use the exposure warning tool, which is very nice uh, and helps you to, to get uh, overexposed areas under control. When we go here through the tool tabs, we have the exposure tool tab where we have the exposure correction. Uh, a tool and then you can directly uh, move the slider up and down to do an exposure uh, correction on this image. Uh, on uh, the next we have here the little reset button in, inside the tool so it means if I reset it here it goes back to the original source uh, of, of this uh, settings. If you use the big one over here you reset everything what you did in this image. But uh, now let's uh, go back to this uh, little um, bright areas here in the, in the roof of the building. Uh, we have a tool which enables you to recover highlights because we have here uh, in the end a quite good exposure overall, but some areas only blowing out. Um, and so you can use the highlight recovery slider uh, to recover these highlights and you can use the warning tool that assists you um, to, to get it uh, very uh, Good prepared. So everywhere where the red color appears, you have no, um, um, yeah, no information at all. And if you, when you now recover this information, you can see from the dynamic range of the sensor, you can uh, recover uh, a lot. So like this, uh, you can uh, already see one of the first uh, tools. Then uh, you have uh, the opportunity to mark a couple of images in your. Um, a browser to compare. So when I now uh, select a second image uh, like this, you can you see that you directly see them uh, next to each other. You can select up to 12 images and 12 images will be displayed uh, next to each other. I will now uh, just take these two because uh, I want to compare this area here. Again, uh, using the hand tool, you can directly uh, zoom in. And when you uh, press the shift key, when having this multi-view information, uh, this multi-view uh, view, you can uh, uh, pan in both images at the same time. When you're not pressing the shift key, you only do it in one side. If you're pressing the shift key, you can do it in both. You also can uh, zoom in and out by using your little dial on the mouse if you have one. Um, or again, you can use the slider here. Uh, and uh, so you can um, com easily compare images. If you uh, turn this multi-view off, you have a little button here. Uh, and you select the second one, you see you only see the one that has a little uh, thicker border here on, on the white. Uh, so, but we, we keep it active because it's sometimes uh, very useful. Uh, so uh, let me uh, show you how to uh, customize um, the window a bit because we have a lot of tools we in the, in the normal area optimization would not need. Uh, so uh, you can um, change the view here by pressing here in the uh, main tool tab, the right mouse uh, button, and then you can add, for instance, a tool tab. So I now, for example, add the quick tool tab. So it means you have another one here. If you uh, uh, press it, uh, you see there's already some uh, tools inside. Uh, I, I just uh, say, okay, the histogram is nice to use, white balance we need, exposure, high dynamic range to recover highlights and shadows is good, clarity we don't need. Uh, so I can press on these little uh, three points here and remove the tool. Sharpening we also not need here, uh, crop we don't need and rotation and flip of the image we also not need. So I just remove this here. You even can, when you're pressing the Alt key, you can move uh, this to a different position. So I, uh, to, uh, do, uh, I select it now to have it as a second tool here. I can add tools uh, which I want to use. 
so next to the histogram, uh, I want to use a basic characteristic because when I later on show my uh, so workflow suggestion, uh, you will see that this is a very nice tool. You can also uh, change the order of the tools uh, so uh, like you you um, prefer uh, this. So I also add the lens uh, correction tool because I not really use the lens correction, but what I use is the light follow-up correction you will see later on. And then I also uh, like to have um, uh, the levels tool in here. So, and I even take it three times and you will see later on why. Because now you can select directly red, green, and blue and you see it in one view. Yeah, and uh, always uh, the software keeps it. So it means if you close the program and you start it again, it always come up in the same uh, like before. So now I not attached to this computer a camera. So I uh, use uh, the camera tool tab and I just remove it uh, because I not uh, need it on this uh, computer here. So the camera capture tool tab it named, it disappeared. The lens corrections I also don't need here. The same. And when you go through it, you will see that you can get a, more of uh, rid of this, uh, uh, and so concentrate on the really important tools. After you changed it, you can here go to the window workspace. You can save the workspace, so that means um, that uh, your individual workspace is then always uh, uh, can be can be activated. So I have saved mine here. I named it Arial, and so here you see uh, my suggestion. So again, the first one I not changed anything. The quick tool tab, I showed you what I, I changed uh, before. And then I keep a detail tool tab, uh, which gives me control of certain details uh, of the images. Uh, we will say, see also later on. I keep the uh, uh, adjustment tool tab because when I copy and paste information from one image to another or to a, ban uh, uh, to a bunch of images, I, I uh, normally have a look here inside before I copy this, but we will see later on. I have the metadata tool tab, I have my processing tool tab and the, the batch queue tab. So this is all in here in my preset. If you want to go back, uh, you can press default and then you have the default uh, um, view again. So like the software was installed and now you have access to all the tools, but I personally prefer uh, this one because then I have only the tools available, which uh, I'm interested in. Okay, yeah, so uh, in the uh, quick tool tab, I now have the most uh, adjustment tools. So again, exposure corrections, you can uh, directly exit it here um, and um, yeah, can directly um, change it. But now I, I would come to my suggested workflow because it helps you for airborne images uh, uh, and it is quite nicely and it also repeats in the same style in the most projects. Again, it is not helping everywhere, but it, give, it should give you at least everywhere a very good starting point. Uh, and again, you can use it on multiple images at a time. So let's um, select uh, another image here. Um, I take this one because um, the first uh, image, which I now start to optimize, um, you should uh, be very careful which one you, you take because uh, the workflow uh, should uh, work for the whole flight, yeah. And you see that a flight normally have different uh, kinds of of, of uh, situations. So here we have a lot of fields, we have the city, and and so you have changing conditions. Here we have river and so on. So I try to pick an image which uh, represents, um, I would say, an average of all the images. Yeah, this is sometimes hard uh, to find, but uh, nevertheless uh, try it. Uh, and uh, I think in the first uh, two to three tries, uh, you you will maybe uh, select first a wrong one and select later on the better working one. But get, let me get you um, some comments on this, how to identify the best one. So again, it should reflect uh, the average of your flight. Um, and so like this, I always try to get a most complex image as possible. So uh, uh, this is quite complex because we have green, we have streets, we have buildings and everything. This would not be so complex because we have a lot of fields. Uh, the same is uh, happening here. We have a lot of river in the image. Uh, and uh, so I, I go for this one. But it's always helping for some automatic tools uh, that you have a bit of gray inside your image. And we have it here on the streets. Uh, so this will also help us uh, uh, to get a good starting point for all the images. So let me continue with my selection uh, or with my proposal. 
again uh, select the image which uh, has a very complex um, um, uh, motif and uh, also um, try um, yeah take some time to identify the right one it helps you later on to save a lot of time for my uh, workflow you need to uh, change one preference settings which is not uh, activated by default when you install capture one so and this is the only one you need to change uh, so go to the edit uh, tool here in the, in the edit menu here in the preferences and inside the preferences go to exposure and there for the levels tool you have an option to choose so the factory default is rgb channel uh, and uh, for my so workflow suggestion you you need to change it to red, green, and blue. So when you did that, you can close this again, and now all the tools are working as uh, I expected. So what I do first, uh, again, select the suitable image which represent uh, the average of your flight. Then you go to the basic uh, char base characteristics and uh, the factory default setting for Capture One is film standard curve. Uh, which is normally made for professional photographers. So they want to have it looking all nice and sweet, but we want to have it realistic. Uh, so I choose a linear response. You not uh, certainly need to change it every time because for your camera type, you can save this as default. So it means when you push this once uh, uh, and every time you load or import an image from the same camera, it will uh, use the same default setting so it will use the linear curve as this is as your selection yeah I, I did not prepare this ahead but uh, for this camera type um, I did it manually so uh, then the next step uh, I lose I uh, use lens corrections because every lens has a certain light fall off from the center to the corners on this lens is already pretty good but nevertheless we can optimize the uh, camera the lenses uh, the phase one lenses are all already automatically um, uh, selected here because in the metadata of the image it is already uh, noted uh, so you not need to um, to select the pro right profile because it's auto selected but then i go to light fall off i type in 100 percent and so now we have a perfectly homogeneous uh, light distribution on this Im image so this is the only uh, thing I, I use from the lens correction tool nothing else yeah the next step is I use automatic exposure correction because the linear uh, response is uh, slightly too dark in my uh, opinion. And uh, But also here I need, when you install a capture one the first time, you need to customize it. So if you press the right mouse button here, um, you can um, change uh, what, uh, when you're pressing this A for automatic, what uh, uh, the camera should change automatically. I uh, see the only function that is active is exposure. I switched everything else off already. I would suggest you, you do the same. So then I go to automatic uh, exposure correction. I then again uh, uh, take care of my highlights and shadows. Uh, I can use here again this uh, little helping tool, uh, but I also uh, have uh, uh, here um, some suggestions. So highlight recovery, you, you easily can go ver to very high values. You see uh, that is not really uh, um, uh, doing bad things here. It's always good to do good things. The shadows, it depending on your sunset level. So here you see a lot of shadows. So when you not open them, uh, it is uh, a bit um, dark in here. So I also use it here. Um, so for instance, uh, 50 is one f-stop, 100 is second f-stop, same for shadows. And you only change the highlights or the shadows, you not change the whole image. So the mid-tones and the dark tones are, are not changed when you're using the highlight recovery slider and the, the opposite, uh, the highlights and the mid-tones are not changed when using the shadow slider. So the next step in my workflow suggestion is that I use the auto levels corrections, uh, which, are, which are already prepared with this uh, change in the preferences, uh, because it only works in that way when you did before the, the preference change. So here, I have my three channels, I do automatic, and then uh, the software is uh, taking care of only selecting the uh, the areas where you have uh, the most of information. You see the informations here are less and, and, uh, uh, and uh, the software covers it mainly uh, on this uh, part where you have informations inside. Sadly, the automatic is a bit uh, too strong uh, mainly, so I normally decide, I took from the highest value, I, I took uh, nearly one third off, uh, so to keep it simple here, uh, let's decide for uh, yeah just uh, to to um, do uh, 20 
or, or let's take 10. Uh, so it means uh, 41 minus 10, and I take 31. You also get a feeling for that when you do it a lot of times, and then you see it's getting better. So maybe you do once more, nine. So we now uh, changing minus 20. So I, and so it looks much nicer. Yeah. So this now is not too much contrast. It has an average uh, look here, and uh, it the levels correction also um, keeps normally track of your white balance. So if your white balance is wrong, uh, then uh, you get also here uh, the white balance under control. Important is that you always, when you do changes here, you always do it in the same value. So it means uh, I now on every in red, green, and blue, I uh, reduce the value by 20. Yeah, to me, it is a, a quite good looking image. Um, and now I can uh, uh, have it done on, on my uh, sample, on my reference image, which I carefully selected. And now I can copy everything. So it means here on the right uh, top, uh, you see an arrow that is pointing outside the software. This collects all uh, the changes I have applied to this image. And now I select all the images I have in my folder. I even can, before I copy, uh, before I paste all this information into um, the, the other images, I can even view into my clipboard, which is located here. And now I see here the adjustments I put into my clipboard from the uh, source image. So here I see we have changed the film curve, we have highlights and shadow recovered, we did the levels correction, we did the light fall of correction, so everything is there as expected. And now I use the little button here, and you see that Capture One transfer all these changes to all the images. So that's all. So now we have for the full flight, uh, we have uh, the images optimized uh, quite well. So let me uh, so show the same uh, suggested workflow on another uh, set of images that you see that uh, when doing the exact same thing, you get uh, a pretty good uh, starting point again. So let's take this image set. Uh, um, and also here, I uh, ran through the images and also try to select an average. Again, I have here uh, some um, ocean uh, parts, so some, some um, uh, parts of the ocean, land. I have here a bit of housing and, and my streets, which are helping to give a good white balance. So in the end, oops, uh, this uh, I selected from all the images as a suitable candidate uh, to start with. Then my workflow is again the same. So I go to uh, basic characteristic, linear response. I take my lens corrections. I do auto exposure. I correct uh, highlights and shadows. I even try the same values as before. It's looking okay. Do my levels correction. This is a lot too strong. So now I reduce by 30. And not too bad, yeah. So in here, again, in, in rare cases, when you have less of these gray areas, the white balance is not the best one. So you also can change it here to, to uh, use other values and go a bit down. So like this, too much. Okay, this is okay. So again, it works uh, uh, quite nicely. It's the same uh, workflow and it is a huge optimization because uh, we started from here and we end up here. And then again, mark all the images and then um, um, transport the corrections. We have here seen an image, uh, I'm not sure if you saw it in, in, in the beginning, that the first image of the flight line is overexposed. Um, uh, the camera here uh, had uh, a wrong or a, a very off setting as a starting point, and then the camera normally needs one image to adjust. But here you can also then for the first image um, uh, optimize it further. So you can again use the multi view, select uh, the already okay image, and compare it to the overexposed image so that you can really get it in the same way. And you see that the huge dynamic range of the uh, of the camera helps you to even correct this image. So again, this was a starting point, totally overexposed, and that was just what we can uh, squeeze out uh, with Capture One. So again, same workflow, you see uh, very fast, you can, can optimize uh, the images. Let's do it a uh, very uh, last time here on this data set. Here we have a lot of haze in this image. 
images because it's first flown in very high altitude. And I do the same thing again. I already um, prepared for the webinar here to go through the images. Again, I selected this image for a good candidate. I do the linear response. I do the light fall off. I do the dynamic range. I do my auto levels. It's uh, oh, I missed uh, to then go back. I missed to press the automatic exposure button. Automatic levels. And here I go down by 20 as an example. So you can, can try, you see directly what happened. And yeah, looks also quite okay to me. And then again, copy, select all the images. And you have uh, the flight well optimized. Okay, so what can I show next? Um, yeah, let, let me show uh, some more examples. So when you have uh, maybe not, uh, you not do mapping, you do inspection. I have here a set of images taken from a UAV. Um, and this is just a, a inspection of, of a cell phone tower. You see here, so once around the, the tower. And also here we have changing light conditions and so on. And I even here do the same workflow again. So I, uh, I but here it's it's very similar background and all the things you see. Therefore, I need not really to be very careful to select the right image. So I just start with the first one, uh, and I, I do the same workflow again. So linear response, my corrections here. Uh, but now I do one step different because I have changing light directions. Uh, so I now uh, mark all the images and I not do the automatic exposure just on one image, I do it to every image. So now the software is doing it individually to every single image because we have one uh, sun from the facing from the front, from the back and so on. So this is a bit uh, more challenging. And now the, uh, the software do an average um, exposure corrections to every image that helps to get uh, uh, them aligned a bit. Also here, I use my highlights again. Oh, that's too much. Let's do it a bit less. I open the shadows. Uh, also a bit too much, a bit less. And I do my levels correction. You can press the automatic in whatever uh, levels you, you want. We have three times the same tool here. Uh, it's a bit too much. And again, you can, uh, oh, um, yeah, now uh, uh, I did it in just the first image. So I now need to apply this correction uh, on the row of images. And I cannot use this uh, uh, complete copy and paste mechanism anymore because I already have um, changed individually every single exposure. Yeah. So, but here we have in every tool, we have an, a second way to do that. So here's a little arrow facing uh, two, two sides. And when you push this one and you mark ahead all the images, you can transfer this correction from this image to all the others. Yeah. And I can do for high dynamic range. I can do for lens correction, my light fall off. And so you even can afterwards uh, change um, uh, the view. Yeah, yeah, and then again, we have uh, good average corrections uh, for the whole flight, uh, which normally is um, a good way to use. Okay, so yeah, this is, I would say, a suggestion of workflow, which helps you here. Um, now uh, let's see how to combine this uh, to um, IX Capture, because uh, we have the IX Capture tool, uh, which can do a bit more um, uh, when, um, yeah, when ex uh, uh, developing the images, when processing the images. Uh, and uh, just a second. Let me go back to my presentation. Oh, sorry. Okay, so here is just uh, for, for the viewers uh, that you have uh, the steps I did for my uh, workflow proposal here once displayed. So you can 
print it as a checkbox if you make a screenshot from the video later on. The video is recorded so you can see it later on. And here uh, I just want to also to mention when you're working with Capture One and um, uh, IX Capture in combination, you can prepare all your corrections in Capture One, but you not certainly need to process it in Capture One because every time you do corrections on images, Capture One is creating a settings file which is stored uh, beside um, the images itself. So it means uh, next to the images, Capture One creates a Capture One folder and inside there is a settings folder and inside the settings folder for every image is the correction, uh, what you apply to these images. And then when you start IX Capture, and you use images, so select as a source uh, a folder where images already are located and which were already beforehand uh, uh, um, optimized by Capture One. You will have the Capture One folder inside. So IX Capture will read these settings and will use them for processing. Yeah? Uh, for processing, uh, Capture One uh, is uh, our favorite tool for optimizing the raw images. You create the settings which can be used also in the IX Capture processing workflow. You can, if you want to, directly export uh, images from Capture One to the various formats like TIFF or JPEG. You can do batch processing and you can do also flexible output naming options if you want to. But you also can use for processing, also optimization is always needs to be done here. But after you did that, um, um, you can uh, uh, continue with IX Capture. IX Capture can control and monitor up to six cameras, so it's not only can be used for processing the images, you can also use it as a helping tool when you do your image acquisition. Uh, even you can prepare it for hot folder options, that means you uh, draw a certain workflow and then uh, you make a hot folder out of it and every time you put a file into this folder, IX Capture will take it and, and process it automatically. You can, as the same as in Capture One, you can export to different output formats, but you can additionally, and this is uh, special in uh, regards uh, to Capture One, you can export uh, distortion-free images uh, with um, um, metric uh, based on metric calibrations. Yeah. So this here, this is uh, the, the really the image uh, that is distortion-free and uh, and perfectly corrected. We also can do uh, image fusion from our dual sensor head cameras. So it means uh, there's uh, camera types uh, 190 and 280, which has two sensor heads, and, and then the software will take care of merging these images to one output. Uh, and we also can use the software for merging RGB images and near infrared images uh, to um, yeah, four band output formats. Uh, and this uh, also cannot be done with Capture One, but you can do here. And then you can batch process the uh, same as Capture One to different uh, output locations if you want to. Just to show you an example for uh, a workflow when combining uh, the power of uh, optimization, your images uh, from Capture One uh, with a, a capacity of uh, creating distortion-free images or even four-band images as your output format. So uh, we started again, work everything out in, 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 in uh, Capture One. So here we see the source format, uh, the source image on the left, the raw file, in the center, the near infrared raw file. And then uh, when we put this all together without applying any changes, you get the right uh, uh, CRR uh, um, output. When I do optimization, uh, I just left on the left-hand side, I use my suggested workflow. Uh, to come from, from this image to this image. Uh, I did nothing on the near infrared image except of light fall off correction to have a homogenic uh, light distribution. And then uh, if you put this together, you get uh, the output on the right hand side. But on this particular flight, um, there was very uh, um, bad light, light conditions uh, or uh, less um, uh, um, response from from the vegetation and you see here that uh, normally the red areas are very low so you can also use uh, uh, capture one to optimize this so uh, we used on the left the raw file optimize it with the suggested workflow take the near infrared image do the light fall off correction and then push uh, the whole image uh, by one f-stop plus in exposure and you see when you put this together, uh, the CR output is, is uh, showing more uh, uh, reflections. And, and then uh, doing this another step, um, uh, if you have images set like this, where uh, the response of the near infrared is very uh, low, you can also push it by two f-stops and then you get an example on the right-hand side. 
So uh, in lots of applications, this is a valid uh, way to optimize it, but there are also are certain applications where you need near-infrared images. Uh, you need to con consider this change of, of your near-infrared channel uh, for further output analyzation process. So if you have a calibration, so sometimes you have calibration targets for agricultural applications, then you need to be uh, uh, taking this into account that there was a correction made uh, and you need to, to um, add this to your analyzes later on. Yeah, this uh, I think for the time uh, Capture One is so powerful that there's a lot more to tell, but uh, I hope I could get you a good overview uh, so far. Um, and uh, now we have some times for uh, questions. So Matthias, if you have some questions collected. Um, uh, hello everybody. So we have uh, three questions only. Um, one is already answered. This was uh, whether a recording of this presentation will be provided. Yes, uh, there will be one provided in a few days' time for to just to see it again. Uh, then we have two technical questions. One is for the IXU 150. I, I assume he minds the IXM 150. Do you do you suggest to import the LLC? For the IXU 150, do, do you suggest to import a LLC file? Then um, correct. It, it's not uh, essentially needed. So um, let me. Um, so the lens correction, um, lens uh, LCC, lens cast correction uh, uh, can do different things. So first of all, um, it can, uh, there are some lenses, especially in the commercial uh, uh, photography market, this has not a, a accurate color distribution. So it means you have maybe, especially in the corner, you have some color movements uh, or chromatic aberrations and, and something like that. So the better lenses normally not have this, so, uh, so we not, essentially need to correct it with this tool because this tool can can do this correction. What the tool also can do, the lens cast correction tool is it can uh, help you to get rid of the light fall off. Yeah. So if you have a lens which is not part uh, of the phase one, uh, I would say uh, portfolio, uh, you can use it um, to, um, yeah, to do a light fall off correction because this also can be done with the LCC. So if you, for instance, not find the profile inside Capture One uh, that's supporting your particular lens, uh, you can use uh, this um, uh, here, yeah. Okay, um, the next question is uh, from the same participant also uh, relating to the LLC. How can a user create a LLC manually? So this needs a bit of preparation because uh, lens cast correction means that you take a sample image, uh, which I would say show the overall um, uh, behavior of your lens, of the light distribution and color distribution. And uh, to do a correction of this, um, you can uh, use a little plastic uh, board. Yeah, this is normally a translumined white uh, a plastic board, which has some uh, transparency. So it's, uh, uh, it's translumed. Uh, as transluent and, uh, and then you take a photograph uh, when you're covering the lens uh, fully with this little plastic board. Yeah? Um, and then you take a photograph and in the end you only get uh, an image which is nearly uh, fully gray. Yeah? But sometimes it also shows the light fall off to, uh, fall off to the corners and you can uh, use this uh, to correct uh, this light fall off. And also sometimes, uh, again, uh, it's only behave on, on um, uh, I would say, uh, commercial lenses on the professional lenses is not seen uh, very much, um, that you have maybe also a color uh, a gradient on the, on the corners. Um, and this you also can then compensate with this tool. Okay. And then in the end, you do your reference image, and then inside the LCC uh, tool from Capture One, you can um, uh, uh, make a reference uh, a correction out of it, and this correction you can apply to every image. There's honestly a very good description of it uh, in our um, uh, support database. So if you visit phase1.com or capture1.com, uh, then you can get to the support uh, knowledge base and type in LCC, and you get a very qualified. Um, uh, uh, step-by-step -step explanation how to do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. But also okay. I'm happy if, if the participant sent me an email uh, uh, to, to get further instruction if needed. Yeah. Good, uh, we just got some more questions in. So the next question is, uh, what is the best way to export to TIFF to preserve image quality? So uh, for sure using uh, uh, Capture One or IX Capture because when we uh, do the transition from RAW to um, to TIFF, 
uh, we have a, a lot of uh, um, experience in how to do that. So it means uh, the, the original raw image is a, a not full color image. It's just the sensor information. And we do, uh, uh, as we have a sensor with RGB channels, we have to do demosaicing, debiring, and, and so on. So we do a lot of steps to, to get uh, pixel by pixel the most out of it. Uh, and uh, But when you then transfer it to, um, to TIFF, the TIFF is a lossless uh, compressed uh, file, yeah, uh, or it not even has a compression. So a TIFF is a valid format to save most of, of your image quality. Uh, and all the important steps for uh, exposure corrections uh, and all the manipulations you normally do in Capture One, please do them on the raw format uh, mainly and then export to TIFF because when you take the TIFF and do the same on this TIFF file, you will see that you have a, a very small range in, in optimization only left over yeah okay next question uh, can i do a fast mosaic using iiq phase one program with imu data or do i need other programs for uh, mosaic you need uh, really other programs to do that uh, because uh, capture one or ice capture can't do that uh, yet um, you can help uh, you because in Capture One you can export, or even in, in uh, IX Capture you can export smaller formats of it. So it means uh, you can in the in the um, uh, tool tab where you can change the parameters for uh, for export. You can change, uh, for instance, that you not want to cover 100% resolution. You only want to export, I would say, 10 20% resolution, and then you have smaller files uh, where you can easily do that in in uh, third-party programs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Um, can I customize my images with COO12 without importing? So I won't have a second copy of IIQ. Uh, yes, you can uh, um, you not need to use a session. Um, you also can directly inside uh, Capture One uh, on the, on the, in the library uh, folder tool tab you can directly enter your hard disk yeah and then you go to the uh, folder where your images already are located yeah and then you directly can work on these images in this folder yeah and then no image is, is moved somehow so only when you start editing capture one will add to this folder next to the images all the corrections the settings uh, which you then can use for processing yeah. okay uh, then there is another question related to the LCC um, creation. Is this also done for all f-stops? Uh, the uh, light distribution uh, of the lens is changing when uh, changing the f-stops. Yes. So in when you make uh, want to make it very accurate, and you use an own self-made LCC or light fall cor uh, of correction, then I would suggest to do it uh, uh, for every uh, uh, aperture. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, this well, there are all questions. Um, to the participants, if you have any further questions, just contact Carsten directly or our support teams. Um, so there are no more questions from my side or from your side. Um, thanks for that. And I hand back to Carsten now to close the presentation. Okay, yeah. And thanks uh, uh, to all the viewers for joining this uh, webinar. I'm looking forward to see you again on the next webinar. We do it on a monthly basis, uh, and like always, the webinar is recorded and will be provided here within the next two or three days on our website, so you can go back and view it again or reference it to someone uh, you you think also uh, want to see that. Um, yeah, thanks uh, again for joining uh, our webinar and have yourself a wonderful and great day. <laughs>